Welcome to 3.1 Models of the Atom. Uh, it says the unleashed power of the atom has changed everything, save our modes of thinking, and thus we drift towards unparalleled catastrophe. It's a famous quote from Albert Einstein. The learning goals. For us, you should be able to understand the experimental design results in analysis that led to the various models of the atom. So it's not enough just to say, hey, this is the Bohr model of the atom. You need to understand why it's the Bohr model of the atom and what it what it addresses. You need to understand the progressive nature of scientific theories and you also need to be able to determine the number of protons, neutrons, and electrons in an element, ion, or isotope. So what we already know. Atoms are the smallest particle that retain chemical and physical properties. You should know that from middle school. You should know from common sense that atoms are very small and you should know from middle school that atoms are made of protons, neutrons, and electrons. Now what you learned in the lab is that changing the protons changes the identity of the element, the charge, and the mass. Changing the neutrons changes only the mass, and changing the electrons changes the charge. You should have also had some experience with the atomic models as far as firing um, different parts of light and seeing what happens to the various models of the atom. So the first thing we do is we start off with the idea of the atom. The atom was first theorized in ancient Greece, but at that point it was just a philosophical idea. Dalton was the first one, this is John Dalton, he was the first one to provide experimental evidence that perhaps there could be an atom. And how he did this is he mixed various amounts of gas. So we have balloons here representing hydrogen gas and oxygen gas. And what he found out is he predicted that the gases would combine in different ways to form new products. So his prediction was that he would get H2O, that he would get H2O2, and that he would get HO2. By mixing various amounts, very carefully produced amounts of gas, he figured that he would get different products. It turns out that he didn't get that. What he got was when he mixed two parts of hydrogen and one of oxygen, he got water and nothing left over three and one, he got one water, but then he had leftover hydrogen. When he got four of hydrogen and one of oxygen, he had two leftover hydrogen and one water. And what he found out is he found out that there were definite patterns in the data. And the pattern that you should be able to recognize in this particular data is the fact that water is always produced and water is H2O. So the fact that he got water as H2O means that the ratio of the gases have to be in a 2 to 1 ratio to you for you to have no product left over. Okay, And so that's very, very difficult to do. But what he did is using this idea of combining multiple proportions, he was able to show that elements can rearrange themselves to form new substances. And so this is what Dalton postulated. These are Dalton's postulates, and you are responsible for knowing these. That elements are small particles called atoms. All atoms are identical. So if you have one gold atom, it is the same as another gold atom. That atoms cannot be created, divided, or destroyed. Okay, that atoms combine in whole number ratios to form new substances. That's the example of H2O. In other words, you can't have H1.5 and then O two thirds to make something. You, you gotta have whole number ratios. And that atoms can combine, separate, and be rearranged, but you can't destroy the atom himself. These are what's known as Dalton's postulates and was the first basis for a scientific theory about the atom. Dalton's model of the atom was relatively simplistic. Think of it like, an, like a marble. It, can, it was composed of elements. They were indivisible, they were spherical, and they were solid. So this right here is a solid atom it's no differentiation, it's the same all the way through, and that's Dalton's model of the atom. Next, we have Thomson's experiment. Now, Thomson's experiment addressed the, sol the, sol the solid, uniform nature of the atom. What he did is he created something called cathode rays by subjecting a gas to a large voltage. And then Thomson take and directed these cathode rays between two charged plates. Now, the reason that Thomson do th did this is he knew that opposites would attract. And so he was testing the cathode ray to see what the nature of the cathode ray was because the cathode ray had come from the gas. And in doing so, these were his results. Okay, The cathode ray was unknown. But he noticed that when it came close towards the positive plate, and the bottom plate was negative, that it was deflected, um, that it should have been deflected downward, okay? Oh, oh, no, I'm sorry, it was deflected upward, I'm sorry. It was deflected upward, okay? And then when it was positive and positive plates, that it stayed in the same direction. And that what is negative and positive, it was directed downward. Now, what patterns do you see in the data? The pattern that you should see is that it was always attracted towards the positive plate. Positive plate, and that if there were two positive plates, 
there was no effect. And if there were two negative plates, there was no effect. So this, this particle or this, this cathode ray was always moved towards the positive plate. Now he knew that opposites attract. So if this was a positively charged plate and it was attracted to it, that means that the cathode ray had to be negative at that point. And so Thompson said, okay, well, atoms can be divided into smaller constituents because I was able to create these cathode rays from atoms. And so that although atoms are electrically neutral, they have negatively charged particles in them, and we now know those as electrons. He called them corpuscles of charge. Um, but because of the fact that the atom as a whole is neutral, and there are negative charges, that means there must be some sort of positive charge in the atom as well. So then we get the Thomson model of the atom. A lot of times it's referred to as the chocolate cookie or plum pudding model. But basically what it says is this. You have the atom that's still solid or that's still spherical. But instead of being solid, you have area of the atom that is positive and within the diffuse positive charge. So it's positive everywhere with the exception of these negative charges. So that's why it gets the chocolate chip cookie name. You have the positive part, which is the cookie itself, which is all positive. And then you have these negative parts, which represent the chocolate chips. That's the Thomson model of the atom. Now, if you notice, this is an improvement on the Dalton model of the atom in the sense that it's taken it and it's divided the atom into smaller pieces. So it actually violated one of Dalton's postulates in saying that atoms cannot be subdivided further. And that's not entirely true because Thomson was able to break up an atom and say, atoms are composed of separate things. It does not mean that Dalton was necessarily incorrect. It just means that Thomson's model is more accurate than Dalton's given the information available to him. Okay, next we have what's called the Geiger-Marsden experiment. Sometimes it's referred to as the Rutherford experiment. Rutherford was the guy who was in charge of the lab. Uh, Geiger and Marsden were the ones who actually did the experiment. But what they did is they actually took something called alpha particles. And alpha particles are actually helium nuclei, which consist of two protons and two neutrons together in a nucleus. Okay, So they take this thing and they fired it at gold foil. Okay, And the malleability of gold, Okay, malleability is the ability to be pounded into thin sheets. The malleability of gold allowed them to produce gold that was only a few atoms thick. And so it was basically like a very, very thin tissue paper almost of gold. Now because of this gold foil, they were firing these alpha particles at incredible speeds. So they were expecting uh, the alpha particles to go straight through the gold foil because they likened it to firing a mortar at a piece of tissue paper or a gun at a piece of tissue paper. And so if obviously the bullet's not going to be stopped by the tissue paper. But these are the results of the experiment. For 8,000 trials, 7,200 of them went straight through which is exactly what they would expect. But, 799 times, instead of going straight through, they slightly deflected. So instead of coming, instead of coming straight through, they would come and they would deflect. These are what we call small or partial deflections. And then once out of 8,000 trials, this is every 8,000 trials, they didn't do just 8,000. Once out of every 8,000 trials, it would take and it would turn around and it would hit back here. And this is this is akin to seeing tissue paper stop a rifle. So what do you see in the data? And this is what they came up with. That there is a positive charge that is very, very dense and very, very small that they call the nucleus. Okay, so what they have is they said that there is a very, very small part of the atom that is positive. Now the explanation for the, they, that they had for this was the fact that the only way the alpha particle, remember the alpha particle is positive, opposites attract but like charges will repel. So the only way that you could actually turn around this alpha particle is if it came very, very, very close to something that was also positively charged. That would make it turn around and go the other direction. So that was that's what we have. We said that there was a positive small uh, particle that contains the positive charge that the majority of the mass, that this is very, very dense and very, very massive, and that the rest of the atom is mostly empty space. The reason why they came up with it that it's mostly empty space is this only happened one out of 8,000 times. So it is very, very unlikely to hit this thing because it is very small relative to the atom as a whole. Based on this, Rutherford developed his model, the atom, that's often referred to as a planetary model. It says that you have a positive nucleus at the center, so here's my positively charged nucleus, and that the electrons move around the nucleus at a variety of distances. So they spin around and they orbit, kind of like that. Okay, So 
this is an interesting model because it refers to it, it still improves on the fact that Thompson said that there had to be a positive charge, but he didn't know how it worked. Rutherford is now saying, yeah, yeah, here's how the positive charge works. And so it's an improvement based on it. Now, it doesn't mean that Thompson was wrong with what Thompson did. Rutherford has more information and has improved the model. Now we have the Bohr experiment. Bohr took glass tubes and he filled them with gas. So these are glass tubes filled with gas. And then he ran a large electrical current through it. Whenever he did that, it actually produced light. That's what you see when you see neon lights. Okay, so when he did this, um, he saw an interesting pattern. And here's the data. Whenever you do helium, helium only in the tube, this is what you get. This is what you get for hydrogen, mercury, neon, and sodium. Now, an interesting thing that you should see here is that every element has a different and unique set of colored lines. We call them spectral lines. So that's really interesting in here because if you were to look at this idea from the previous model of the atom, the electrons could be anywhere. And so light could be anywhere. So now let's take a look at what we have with the Bohr model. Every atom had a consistent and unique spectral pattern and produced few colors. So what that means is the electrons have to have specific or what we call discrete energy levels. So the electrons can be here or here, but they can't be in between. Okay, so that's an interesting thing because that's an improvement based on the previous model. So Bohr developed his model of the atom that was very similar to Rutherford's, but it had one key difference. Once again, you had the positive nucleus in the center. You had the electrons that are on the outside, but the difference is, is all the electrons, instead of being anywhere, had to be in very, very specific places that he called orbits or orbitals. Now, Bohr also hypothesized that when an electron moves up, it's absorbing, the atom is absorbing energy. So it's moving the electron up to the next orbital level. And that a line is produced, the, line, the spectral line is produced as an electron falls to the lower orbital level. And that's why there is a very specific color of light that's produced when you move from here to here. Because it's a very specific energy as you move down. Now, which of the following is the most accurate model of the atom, and you need to justify your response using the CLEAR method? Now, the CLEAR method, remember, is conclusion, evidence, and reasoning. So the first thing you need to do is come up with an answer. And the conclusion that I would draw is I would say that the Bohr model of the atom is clearly the most accurate, or the most accurate model. Okay, the evidence that I have to support it was that it includes the protons, or the nucleus. It includes the electrons and it includes orbitals. The other models, some include protons and electrons, but they don't have orbitals. One includes electrons but not protons or orbitals, and so it's one of those things where they've been built on each other. So the evidence that I have is that the Bohr model has protons, neutrons, or excuse me, protons, electrons, and orbitals, whereas the other ones do not. And that would be my reasoning, that the Bohr model of the atom includes more pieces of information or a greater specificity than the previous models did. In this example, it says, assume that electrons could have any energy in an atom. Describe what the results of the Bohr experiment would be using the CLEAR method. So the idea is that the electrons can have any energy, and that was actually proposed by Rutherford. So if you were to use the Rutherford model, what you would have is you have a nucleus, and then you'd have electrons that could take any energy whatsoever. So you could have an electron transition from here to here, or here to here, and so on and so on and so on. So the idea is, if you have this particular model, how would the Bohr line spectra uh, differ? Now remember, the Bohr line spectra produced very specific energy levels that represented a transition from one orbital to the next. But if you have all possible energies, that means that an electron could transfer from here to here and produce this line, and here to here, which would produce this line, and an infinite number of lines, because all orbitals would be possible. So if the Rutherford model for the atom would have been correct, what you would have expected was all lines of the spectra produced for each element. In other words, you'd have a solid continuation of color from red to violet. So you'd see all colors of red, all colors of orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, and violet all the way through the spectrum, and there would be no differentiation between atoms. Okay, so now how would you write this up using the clear method? The first thing you need to do is you come up with an answer. So you would say all colors of light 
would show up or a present or something along those lines. The evidence that you would have to support that is it would say um, light, or you would say all um, electrons can have any energy. Your evidence should come from the information that's provided to you. Your reasoning that you should have is something that links the evidence to your answer. So by saying all electrons can have any energy does not necessarily mean that you have light until you say light is produced by falling electrons and any number, any amount of energy falling to any amount of energy produces all colors of light. The next example we have is a mastery level question. It says, explain how our model of the atom would be different if the results of the Geiger-Marsden experiment would have resulted in the following. So what you see here is you see an example of how it would be different if they didn't measure correctly, how you could be incorrect if you didn't follow proper protocol. Um, but what you see here is there are 8,000 particles with no deflection and that there is no deflections, there's no partial deflections, there's no um, any deflections. So an interesting thing about this would be, there's, there's multiple answers, but basically you would say that there is no nucleus. Okay, remember the reason why there were deflections was because there was a very solid, very dense nucleus. Now, if this was a test question or a quiz question, what I would expect you to do would be expand on that. You would say there's no nucleus, so maybe the positive charge is right next to the electrons or maybe it's the diffuse positive charge of the Thomson model. So you know that the atom has to be neutral. So what I would be looking for if I was grading this is I'd say, did they somehow say that there's no nucleus because there's no deflections? And did they somehow say the positive charge has to be X, Y, Z or something along those lines because the atoms are still neutral? Next, we have, uh, we're have we going to go through the model of the atom in a little bit more detail. You have the proton. A lot of times protons are signified by a P with a, a plus superscript. Uh, they're the positively charged particle. They're found in the nucleus. They have a large mass that's relatively speaking. We're talking about small scale, but they have a very large mass. They have a very small volume. Because of that, they have an extremely large what we call density. So they determine the identity of an element. So if you have two protons, guess what? You're helium. It doesn't matter anything else about the atom. If you have two protons, you're helium. If you don't have two protons, you are not helium. Next, you have the electrons. The electrons are negatively charged particles. They're found in orbits around the atom. They have negligible mass. Okay, but what that means is it's very, very, very small, even when compared to the mass of a proton. The mass of a proton is 1.672 times 10 to the minus 27th kilograms, which is a small in and of itself, but the mass of an electron is 9.11 times 10 to the minus 31st kilograms, which is over a thousand times smaller. It's roughly 10,000 times smaller than a proton. So to to put it in perspective, we say that the electron has negligible mass. Now, the electron does move in a very large volume, but it does not occupy a large amount of volume. So the electron moves in a big circle around the atom, but it's not occupying that whole circle at one time. The difference between the number of protons and electrons determines the charge. So P plus minus E minus equals the charge. Notice you can have a positive charge if protons exceed electrons. You can have a negative charge if electrons exceed protons. Then we come to the Chadwick experiment. This one is often neglected. Um, it was a very, very difficult experiment to do. So what they have is they had an alpha particle source, the same alpha particles that we saw in the Rutherford experiment, that actually collided with a beryllium molecule. This beryllium molecule ejected what we now know are neutrons. Now they didn't know these were neutrons at the time, but they did know that if they put polonium on beryllium, the beryllium would lose mass, which was weird because it was still beryllium, but it was losing mass. In other words, it wasn't a chemical reaction. So then the particles that came off collided with paraffin wax. And what happened as a result is these para when it collided with paraffin wax, all of a sudden you had protons and electrons that were present. And that was really interesting because you had these massless, chargeless particles, or not massless, excuse me, they were massive, but they were chargeless particles that when they collided with paraffin, all of a sudden had protons and electrons. So what that indicated is that it was a combination of a proton and an electron 
which made it electrically neutral, and that made it a neutron. Now, the thing that was very difficult about measuring this, the neutron, is the neutron is big, so it's hard to move. And once again, this is relatively speaking. I say it's big compared to an electron. And it's not charged, so you can't put a positive or a negative plate and have it attract to it. So the neutron was difficult to find. This is Chadwick. He's, uh, this is an, So it determined there was an electrically neutral particle that was also in the nucleus and that also contributed to the mass, but not necessarily to the element or anything along those lines. So once again, we add the neutrons. You see that it's a neutral particle. It's found in the orbits around the nucleus. It has about the same mass as a proton. Um, they're different, like one is 1.672 and one is 1.673, but they're basically the same mass. Um, they are located in the nucleus, uh, and so you have a complete model of the atom. So now our model of the atom has protons and neutrons held together in the nucleus, okay, together. And then the electrons surrounded the nucleus with distinct energies called orbitals. So a lot of times this is also referred to as the Rutherford model, or excuse me, the Bohr model of the atom, with just the inclusion of neutrons into the nucleus. Okay, now we have nuclear symbol notation. Uh, nuclear symbol notation is how we reference atoms because they can have a different number of neutrons. Uh, and that's what we saw whenever you have you can add neutrons and it'll affect the mass, but it won't affect what the chemical properties are itself. So the nuclear symbol notation uh, starts by identifying the number of protons. You write the number of protons right here on the bottom left, and notice how it's in front of the letters. And then this right here is the element that also has two protons, so the atomic number of two. These two things must match no matter what. Helium and two, lithium and three, hydrogen and one, carbon and six, so on and so on and so on. The element has to match that particular number. Then what you do is you write the mass on the top left corner of the symbol. So this right here represents the atomic mass. Now atomic mass references the number of protons plus the number of neutrons. So in this particular case, the atomic mass of three indicates that I have two protons and one neutron. Now if you notice, there is nothing here on the top left corner of these but here you see protons minus electrons. Now since there's nothing that's written there, what I can imply, or what I can assume, is that this is zero, indicating that there is no charge, so I would have two electrons as well. This is what is called nuclear symbol notation, and if you write something in nuclear symbol notation, you can know all of the subatomic particles that are present in a particular atom. Since a substance has a charge, if the number of blank does not equal the number of blank. So we're looking at subatomic particles here. Remember we have protons, neutrons, and electrons. And so a substance has a charge, okay? So charge is positive slash negative. If the number of blank does not equal the number of blank. Well, we can throw neutrons out because neutrons is the one that doesn't fit because it's not charged, it doesn't affect the charge in any way. So we can say protons and electrons. Next, it says write the correct nuclear symbol notation or the number of each of the subatomic particles for the two substances below. So here we see eight protons, 10 neutrons, and 10 electrons. So what that allows us to do is we can say eight, and then we would look at our periodic table and we'd say, okay, what's the element that has an atomic number of eight? And that is oxygen. So we have eight and then oxygen. Now the next thing we have to do is we have to reference the atomic mass. The atomic mass refers to the protons plus the neutrons. So I would put an 18 there. And then the last thing that I would do is I would need to indicate the charge right there. I look at the difference between the number of protons and the number of electrons. If I do protons minus electrons, I get eight minus 10, which actually gives me a minus two. And so I usually put a two and then a minus to indicate. You usually don't put the minus in front of the two because it can get kind of confusing. So this right here is actually our nuclear symbol notation for this top one. This bottom one right here actually gives me the nuclear symbol notation, so I need to do the opposite. The first thing that I can do is I can recognize that there are 36 protons. How I know that is because that's the atomic number right there, and that number never changes. The second thing that I can recognize is that's the atomic mass, which references the number of protons and the number of, of the number of protons plus the number of neutrons. So if I subtract the total number of protons and neutrons minus the number of protons, that right there would indicate to me the number of neutrons. So I know that I have 42 neutrons. Finally, there is no charge indicated. Since there's no charge indicated, I know that I have the same number of protons and electrons, so I have 36 electrons. 
The last slide that we have says the equation shows the fission of plutonium. Using your knowledge of the atom, predict the missing product. Now, we know for the atom that you can't create or destroy particles. You just can't do it. It's conservation of mass. So now if we look at this thing, this thing indicates that I have a total mass of 239 and that I have a total mass of 235. You know that shouldn't be able to work. So you know that you're missing 4 for your atomic mass. Okay, this 4 for atomic mass also indicates, we can also look at the other things. I know that I have 94 protons, and I know that I have 92 protons. So I know that I'm short 2 protons. Now, if I have 4 and an atomic number of 2, that indicates this. So what was missing was a helium atom. This is an example of what we call a nuclear reaction. We will come to nuclear reactions towards the end of the year, but just using your knowledge of the, of the atom and nuclear symbol notation, you were able to predict the product of a nuclear reaction.